So each night over the past number of evenings, I think eight now, we've been taking up these topics or words that are found, uh, found often in our Bible and are found especially in the gospel message. If you've ever heard someone declare the good news of Jesus Christ from the scriptures, these words are prevailing thoughts in so much of the gospel, and yet they're opposites. And tonight, our two words that we're going to take up are time and eternity. Time and eternity. Tonight, it's my responsibility to take up that word time. We're looking more at it as in this life, this life. They say the average lifespan now in the United States is 78.3 years, and I think worldwide is 72.6 years. That life, that time that we are given. In this world, well, the Bible says salvation, salvation has everything to do with that time. And we're going to speak on that tonight from the Bible. We're going to read one verse. It's found in John chapter 10. John 10 is a fantastic chapter for anybody who's listening tonight to go and to read the whole chapter about the Good Shepherd. We've already spoken on John 10 during these meetings, but we're going to speak on another verse tonight from John 10, and we will. Uh, speak on verse 10, John 10 and verse 10. It's a well-known scripture. John 10 and verse 10 says this, the thief come, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. These are the Lord, these are the words of the Lord Jesus. He says the thief, the thief only comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But then Christ says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. A lot of people, when they hear about salvation, forgiveness of sins, they think it's a life insurance policy for the afterlife. I'll, I'll make peace with God eventually. I've heard that. I've heard that more times than I've heard any other response from individuals in my life about forgiveness of sins, of knowing peace with God. They say, Eventually, one day I will, as though life was lived better without peace with God than it would be with peace with God. And so tonight, it's so important for you to understand as you listen, salvation is not a life insurance policy just for eternity, but it is something that makes life worth living. It is the meaning of life. And here, from the words of Jesus Christ, he says, I am come that they might have life. Have it to the fullest. Have it more abundantly. Who listening would say that they want a duller life? They want a, a life less meaningful. No one. No one. It's just the opposite. That's the whole reason that we strive and we, we, we toil and we continue to, to make our best effort in life. Because in these 78.3 years, if we're lucky, we want to have them live to the fullest. It was Abe Lincoln who said, it's not the matter of days in a life. It's the matter of life in the days. So I ask you where you're at tonight. Do you have this life? Do you have this life abundantly that Jesus Christ speaks of? Because the Bible tells me, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Salvation never comes to those who wait till tomorrow. It's now. This is something that is worth having in this moment. Uh, the great preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, to everything there is a season and a purpose for every time. There's a time for every purpose under heaven. Do you have a time when you realize your purpose? They say there are two great days in any individual's existence. Those two great days are this, the day you were born and the day you find out why. The day you were born and the day you realize why you were born. That day could be today. That day could be today to realize the purpose for which God ever created and breathed life into your soul could be today. If only you would recognize that he sent his son. Our verse says, I am come. How tremendous. I am come that they might have life. And they might have it more abundantly. They might have it to the fullest. Those are our texts. That's our text tonight. To use that text. And to speak on this, why salvation is so important now. It was Ty Cobb, a very famous baseball player, I believe for the Detroit Tigers. And he got saved. He got saved from his sin so late in life 
And one of his final statements was this. He says, tell the boys, tell others. He said, I got saved in the bottom of the ninth. I would have done anything to have been saved in the top of the first. Would have done anything to have been saved in the top of the first. Life and its purpose is only reached and only known when someone knows Jesus Christ as their savior. As we look at this verse, I have come that they might have life. We recognize this. How many of us have, have looked at the words of the Declaration of Independence and said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, of which are life. It's our own country that declares it. You would expect it if a country could declare it. Before the U.S. ever declared those words on the 4th of July in 1776, they were the manifesto of our creator that you might have life. You might have it more abundantly. You say, what does salvation bring to a soul? I'm not here to sell you on salvation. I'm here to tell you this is something that is absolutely crucial, necessary for this life to be lived abundantly before God in heaven. You say, why? Tell me, give me a few reasons why this is so significant. You say, I, I look out at a, a masses that are that are going down, uh, going down these streets. Uh, uh, all the individuals in my community, it seems everyone's doing okay without this salvation. And that may be so. You might perceive them on the outside, but but never, never have we had more self-help books, and never had more individuals who are so seeking help in a life that seems to be full of despair, full of hopelessness. We we, we live in a life where transparency has gone out the window. Because we can never tell some people who and what we truly are. And yet here is the opportunity to reveal to God the life that we have will lack any meaning if it is not indwelt by his son, Jesus Christ. What is it? You know, the Lord Jesus, one day they asked him, they said, give us, give us, what does it mean to really live? What does it mean to really live? And he said, I will sum it up in two statements. Love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor the same way. He said, do that, and you will truly live. You will truly live. You know, unfortunately for each one of us, we can't say that we've done either one of them. We can't say we've loved God with our being. Our neighbors, they say higher fences make better neighbors. And yet significantly, this man, Jesus Christ, he showed us what love was because he died for his enemies. He died in order to give us this salvation that then makes it possible because it's only possible through faith in Jesus Christ to ever turn my gaze heavenward and to think that I could love God with my whole being. Why? In response to what he did when he loved me by giving his son for me. The Bible says we did not love him first. He loved us. It's recognizing that love that then in return allows me to love my maker because of what he's done by giving his son. It brings true life to love my neighbor as myself, to see another soul for whom Christ has died, to see someone else that can also know Christ. You say it's only possible. The Lord Jesus says, do this and live. We have all failed. And yet there was one man who did do it. Jesus Christ loved God completely, loved man completely. You'd say, did he live? No, he died. He died in order for all of us who have failed so miserably at loving God and loving our neighbor in order for given that opportunity, that God-given opportunity for us to be able to do it through the power of Christ, through the power of his love that indwells us because we have believed on him. That's salvation, not only love, but satisfaction, satisfaction in a life. What it takes to be satisfied this day, these days are, are, it's outside of, of the, the reaches of almost every individual. Satisfaction cannot be found in money. It cannot be found in objects. It cannot be found in homes. It, it can't be found in occupations. We know that. We're living proof to that. And yet we try and we try and we try, as the song says. We can't find it. You know, one of the most significant individuals in the Bible, his name is mentioned more than any other name except for the name of Jesus Christ, his name was David. 
same as my name. In one of his Psalms, Psalm 17, he said this, I will be satisfied when I'm like Christ. I will be satisfied when I awake with his likeness. You'd say it's impossible to be like him. No, the Bible says, Bible says salvation. It makes me just like God's son, Jesus Christ. It, it conforms me to his image. It's something I couldn't do on my own, but God does when he reaches and he saves a lost soul. Satisfaction, the chance to be satisfied with the only person that God is satisfied with. Isaiah 53 tells me that is the chance of a lifetime tonight, a chance offered to you because satisfaction is found in none other than Jesus Christ. Not only love, not only satisfaction, but joy, true joy. You know, they say, I, I agree with it to a certain extent. I guess I agree with it fully. They say happiness is based upon what happens. Uh, before the meeting, I was speaking to someone. They said, I had a great day today. I had a great day. And they tell you things that made it a great day. Things that you would say could go either way. I, 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 some Mondays are very lousy because of what happens. And, and, and some Mondays are, are okay because of what happens. But to live a life based on what happens to you is no life at all. The Bible offers a life based on joy. Why? Because it's rooted in someone who doesn't change Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's someone who never changes. Someone who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Someone who is the same throughout all of time. You say, tell me that. Who is that someone? Jesus Christ. A joy in a person, a joy in a man who the Bible says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He said, my joy, I leave with you. I don't, I don't leave you the kind of joy that the world leaves. I leave you my joy. It's greater than circumstances. It's greater than troubles. It's greater than what happens. It's greater because it belongs to our maker. It belongs to God. God gives you his joy, and he gives you his life, eternal life, and he gives you it right now. He gives it to you in this life. To have salvation in this life is to be satisfied, and to have a satisfaction no man can take from you. It comes with a guaranteed eternal warranty on it. It's not only have satisfaction, it's to have and to know the love of God. It's to have that true life that comes from knowing. I can respond and start to love God because I recognize the love he had for me. Not only to know that love and to know that satisfaction, but to know that joy, a joy that is inexpressible. Matt talked about that the other night. A joy that is inexpressible, that comes from Jesus Christ. These are tremendous truths, and they are just touching the fringe of salvation. I know that we speak about salvation. You say, ah, you, you haven't convinced me. You know, Salvation gives people meaning in life. Otherwise, the manufacturer never intended for you to be used in any other way but to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We look at devices that we hold. You see a baby pick up a phone and start to knock it on its crib. You'd say, it wasn't the intended use. You, you, you see someone take an average tool and, and misuse it. You say, ah, that, that's not what it was meant for. Not what it was meant for. You, 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 you've used it all wrong. No, what are you doing? We, we want to go show someone the right way to use something. We say, that's not what the manufacturer intended. I was fearfully and wonderfully made. And, you know, it wasn't until as a 15-year-old as a kid, I realized what the manufacturer intended when he made me. It was for me to turn and to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You could know that same enjoyment. You could know that same purpose. You could know it now because behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The Lord Jesus has told us, I have come that they might have life and to have it more abundantly. It was John who told us later in one of his epistles, he said, he that has the son has life. And he that doesn't have the son doesn't have life. It's clear cut. And maybe to some that sounds offensive, but to others, I tell you, in a life where the U.S. has told us it's one of our inalienable rights, the God of heaven has told us this is the greatest right that we have is to have life, to have it more abundantly because of a man who gave his life in order that he could ever, ever offer us that and to promise it to us 
If only you would believe that he died for you, that he died in order that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Salvation is for this life, but continue to listen to Matt as he tells us about salvation and eternity. Thanks, Dave. We're going to read together uh, two verses in scripture here. Uh, really, they sort of piggyback together. But Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to take up the word eternity. Thanks very much for being with us this evening. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 says these words. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. The other reading is in the book of Amos chapter 4 and verse 12. And there are just five words that I want to read there. Prepare, Amos 4 and verse 12, prepare to meet thy God. And that's all we're going to uh, read for this evening. Uh, eternity, uh, when you take up that subject, it would take all of time and eternity to speak on eternity. So quite a deep subject. We have 15 minutes together tonight. But as defined, if you were to look it up in the dictionary, you'd see these words, the infinite or unending time, a state to which time has no application, timelessness, and in regards to theology, the endless life after death. And so as we start this meeting together tonight, I just want to ask you, as you perhaps heard the gospel the last week or so, perhaps you're listening to the message tonight and you've heard the good news of Jesus Christ perhaps your entire life. Maybe this is the first time you hear it tonight, how Christ came. He died on a cross for sins. He paid for sins in full. He was buried and he rose again the third day. The question that as we start this message this evening is this, where will you spend eternity? This moment, this uh, gravity where there's no time, this endless life after death. Sometimes we say, as we speak to our friends, we'll say, oh, I've just been waiting an eternity for my friend to get ready. So perhaps we can go to the mall or do something. It's actually completely inaccurate. Maybe we've been waiting a lot of time, but eternity is where time is no longer. And that is why the writer here is Christ is speaking. He's saying we're to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven or to be saved or to live for Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ came, as Dave mentioned, I am come, he said, that they might have life and life more abundantly. And to provide that life, Christ had to die on an old rugged cross. Many of us on the call today, perhaps looking back and we're saying how life is so short. Maybe you're just a little older, uh, myself, just gonna turn 41 just this August. And I never imagined being married with four children. I never imagined my oldest uh, getting his driver's permit this year. Life at best to him right or right wrote, is very brief, like the falling of a leaf. In other words, the leaf falls from the tree and it hits the ground and a moment of time is just passed. And God wants you to invest your time and for eternity. So let's speak about eternity tonight. Isaac, Isaac Watts wrote the, that hymn, Lord, what a feeble peace. Listen to the words as he reflects on his own uh, brevity of life. Lord, what a feeble peace is this, our mortal frame. Our life, how poor a trifle tis that scarce deserves the name. Alas. To us, brittle clay, he writes, that built our body first, and every month and every day, tis moldering back to dust. Our moments fly apace, our feeble powers decay. Swift as a flood, our hasty days are sweeping us away. Yet if our days must fly, we'll keep their end in sight. We'll spend them all in wisdom's ways and let them speed their flight. They'll waft us soon o'er this life's tempestuous sea. Soon shall we reach the peaceful shore of blessed eternity. The world today would tell individuals, climb the ladder, would tell individuals, build more wealth, would tell individuals, more cars, more homes, larger estate, more time spent. And meanwhile, as that time is being spent, the reality of leaving the comforts of time and entering eternity only get closer. And that time, friend, is unpredictable. Randy Alcorn mentioned those words as, he, as I quote, he who lays up treasures on earth spends his life backing away from his treasures. To him, death is lost. He is despairing. He who lays up treasures in heaven looks forward to eternity. He's moving daily toward his treasures. To him, death is gain. He who spends his life moving toward his treasures in heaven has reason to rejoice. I ask the question today, are you despairing or are you rejoicing? Are you uh, an unbeliever today, never knowing who Christ is, or are you rejoicing in your own salvation? Sad when we see some claiming to have this treasure in heaven, 
Meanwhile, they're running after the treasures of the world where only moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. When we contemplate eternity, there is solemnity to eternity. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. I will tell you today that death is no respecter of persons. I ask the question of today again, as we contemplate eternity, leaving time as we know it in the comforts of time and entering what we don't understand, are you prepared to meet God? For the believer, the question of eternity causes our hearts perhaps to skip with anxiety. But to the believer on this earth, the believer contemplates it. They look forward to eternity. The joy of having God in your life, as Dave mentioned, inexpressible because God never disappoints. One might ask the question, well, uh, when you say God never disappoints, well, what, well, what do you mean? In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, a very special verse just to me personally, I enjoy it. But it says this, in a hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised be before the time began, in a world filled with lies, the writer here is saying, God who cannot lie gives us promises, gives us promises that bring inexpressible joy. God can't lie. The uh, person might be asking the question, well, what if I don't know which direction to go, making decisions after I'm saved? What if I trust Christ and I just don't understand life? Isaiah 41 says this, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. Deuteronomy 31 says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. One might ask the question, what if I get discouraged in this world? The trials, the waves of life, the challenges, this world COVID-19. I don't understand how to traffic through this world. John 16 said this, in me, you have peace. In this world, trouble comes, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And Jesus is saying, I am come, as Dave said, that they might enjoy this life and not only life more abundant life when times get rough an unbeliever might ask where or who do i turn to when i trust christ psalm 32 says i will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go i will counsel you with my loving eye on you is it possible as one reflects on the work of christ is it possible that humans could actually enjoy life yes if you're a believer isaiah 40 and verse 31 to truly enjoy life the way god intended you to enjoy yes if you're a believer, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31, those who hope in the Lord, the believers will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Someone might say, well, Matt, you don't understand. I have anxiety. There's things that are stressful to me, even the smallest of situations. You know what God promises in Philippians chapter four? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The preacher said in a late gone day, God's grace is immeasurable, his mercy inexhaustible, and his peace or his joy inexpressible. Great to be encouraged in time, but we need to live in time preparing for eternity. The psalmist wrote those words, Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am? Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths or the width of my hand. And my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy or making an uproar themselves in vain or for nothing. He heaps up riches, the psalmist wrote, and does not know who will gather them. You and I were recreated, created to spend time preparing for eternity. Time is short and eternity has no end. C.S. Lewis mentioned those words, if we discover a desire within us that nothing in this world can satisfy, also we should be uh, we should be to wonder if perhaps we're created for another world. You ever just sit back sometimes and wonder why you're not satisfied? Ever sit back and just wonder why the void in our heart never gets filled? It's because the human being was created for another world. It was created to glorify God, both in time and for all of eternity. And this God who cannot lie also warns us about eternity. He warns us that sin brings death, death passing upon all men for that all have sinned. He tells us about the removal of our sin through faith in the person of Christ. Charles Spurgeon said these words, there may, there may be some sins of which a man cannot speak, but there is no sin in which the blood of Christ cannot wash away. Is there sin in your life and you're perhaps wondering, would your God forgive my sin? I would tell you, yes, he would. He that, John chapter 3 and verse 36, he that believes on the Son hath everlasting life. Regardless of your sin in the past, regardless of your sin in the present, regardless of your sin in the future, the God of heaven came to seek and to save them that are lost. 
And so eternity involves believers in heaven. Eternity belongs, belongs unbelievers separated from God in damnation forever. I have personally those that I love that have gone on before, perhaps not trusting Christ. I, I don't know where they are. I would tell you that the Bible would tell me where they are if they miss the message of the cross. Abandoned from God's presence for eternity. Weeping, gnashing, darkness, a great gulf fixed between God and man, never to return again, eternally lost. And so the message tonight on eternity is a solemn message. And 150 years from now, there's a guarantee on this call that you and I will be somewhere. In 1,000 years from now, you will be in that same place. In 10,000 years from now, you will be in that same place. In 100,000 years from now, you will be in that same place same place. And if you increase that multiple and you keep going on a hundred thousand and a million and a billion, you only increase the truth of eternity. And I asked the question tonight on the call, where are you spending eternity? To the believer, heaven's their home. To the unbeliever, heaven could be their home if they came to trust Christ. As John 3 and chapter 36 says, solemn words, he that believes on the son hath everlasting life, but he that believes not the son, the wrath of God abides on them in the present Tense. Friend, listen, you missed the message of the cross. You're lost for eternity. Professor of uh, mathematics to a preacher in Nebraska said these words, eternity begins where computation, e computation ends. The preacher asked, well, what does that mean, professor? Professor said, it means this, that when the man with the greatest mind the world has ever known thinks his way out and out and out into the future and his mind fails because it cannot go any farther, that is the beginning of eternity. There is no end. Matthew chapter 26, when we reflect on where the believer goes and where the unbeliever goes for eternity, uh, a, 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 a time that has no ending. And these will go away, chapter 25 and verse 46, into everlasting punishment for the unbeliever, but the righteous into eternal life. The question I ask again, where will you spend eternity? Hebrews 9 says it's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. James 4 tells us about our life, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes it away. You could be spending it with him, saved, on your way to heaven, eternal life, sins forgiven. Isaiah 57 and 15 tells us where he is. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. God can accept souls stained with sin. Souls that are unrighteous. God can accept souls that have had their sins penalty paid for. They've been deemed righteous through the precious blood of Christ. They are cleansed. Their sins and their iniquities, Hebrews says, I will remember no more. They are holy. They are separate from sin's curse. God can receive them to his heaven. I ask the question again, where will you spend eternity? Solemn words. J. Wilbur Chapman, a preacher saved while reading his Christian father's poem. After watching his father pass away peacefully on his deathbed. He read this poem and he came to trust Christ. The poem wrote, went like this, as his father penned. How long sometimes a day appears and weeks, how long are they? Months move as if the years would never pass away. But days and weeks are passing by and soon must all be gone. For day by day as moments fly, eternity comes on. Days, months, and years must have an end. Eternity has none. Twill always have as long to spend as when at first begun. And that dear man, broken with the thought of eternity, separated from God forever, came to understand Jesus Christ as his own personal Lord and Savior. How can I be saved, one might ask. My sins are too dark. How can I be saved, one asks. My sins are too heavy. How can I be saved, one asks. My sins are too burdensome. They're too ugly. They're too sinful. You know what God says in Isaiah and chapter 1? He says these words, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins, your sins, are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be as wool. Where will you spend eternity? The work of Christ presented over the last few days. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've spoken about Romans 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've spoken about John chapter 3, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever looks at him will believe in him, or whoever uh, believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And he continues in John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Friend, listen, as we speak about eternity, don't fall into what Job articulates as the king of terrors. The king of terrors being 
the person who has been confident, been uprooted from the shelter of his tent, and they parade him before the king of terrors in Job chapter 18. Many terrifying things in life, but only the king of terrors mentioned here in Job, and it's when a soul slips out of time, and they enter eternity, and they realize for the first time in their life that they're lost, and they're not coming back. Today, we have the greatest opportunity. Think of Thomas as he hears Jesus speaking about all of heaven as we are preparing in time, for preparing for eternity. But Jesus is speaking about heaven in John chapter 14. And Thomas is so uh, enthralled and so involved in what Jesus is saying. He says, Jesus, how do we know the way? And Jesus tells Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You can know for sure, dear friend, on the meeting call tonight, where you will spend eternity. You say, Matt, ask me the question again. Where am I spending eternity? And I can answer you based upon the death of Christ. I'm spending eternity in heaven because Jesus Christ died for me. Think of the words I end with this hymn. Think of the words as we contemplate the solemnity of eternity. Charles Harrison Mason wrote these words. Life at best is very brief. The chorus reads, be in time, be in time. While the voice of Jesus calls you, be in time. If in sin you longer wait, you may find no open gate. And your cry, be just too late. Be in time. I'm just going to read two verses of it. Fairest flowers soon decay. Youth and beauty pass away. Oh, you have not long to stay. Be in time. While God's spirit bids you come. Sinner, do not longer roam. Lest you seal your hopeless doom. Be in time. Sinner, heed the warning ver voice. Verse 4. Make the Lord your final choice. Then all heaven will rejoice. We learned about that earlier this week. Over one soul that repents. Heaven rejoice. Be in time. Come from darkness into light. Come let Jesus make you right. Come receive his life tonight. Be in time. Billy Graham mentioned the cross shows us the seriousness of our sin. But the good news is this. It also shows us the immeasurable love of God. And dear one, today you could be saved today. You could know in time where you will spend eternity based solely upon what the word of God says about the person of Christ. That God commends god demonstrates his love to you and to me in that while we're yet sinners christ died for us dave spoke on it just the other night christ died for the ungodly come trust him tonight and know for sure your sins are forgiven and a home in heaven and if i asked you the question at later on if i ever met you in person or you wrote to us and we had some correspondence and i asked you that question where will you spend eternity you could turn to me and say Matt, I'll spend eternity based upon what the word of God teaches. My sins were placed upon Christ, and I came to trust and have faith that Jesus Christ came, he died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. And he paid for sins once and forever just for me. And my home in eternity is heaven because Jesus died 